Give me this now, like when he comes in the It's the last fucker that's coming in this place. All right, here's a look at some of the wildest, most unforgettable freakouts on Kitchen Nightmares. And this owner literally got into a brawl right outside his restaurant. Who the fuck is it? Give me this now, like when he comes in the it's the last fucker that's coming in this place. First up, we have Peter's Italian Restaurant, which was supposed to be a cozy, family-run spot in Babylon, New York. But let me tell you that this owner's freakout was one for the books. You're getting fucking hot-headed. What? Did you see my father on the floor? No. So what do you mean I'm getting hot-headed? I'm saying, relax. Owned by Tina Pellegrino, the restaurant was named after her brother, Peter Pasta Pellegrino, who took on the role of host, but let's be real, he acted more like the mafia kingpin of the joint. Tina was fed up with Peter's antics, believing he was the main reason the restaurant was crashing harder than a Windows update. When Chef Ramsay rolled into town, Peter decided to give him the ultimate wait, a whole hour before picking him up in a flashy Mercedes. A real good fellow's audition if there ever was one. This can't be him. Peter was all about his appearance and couldn't care less about the crumbling restaurant. Tina at her wit's end. Chef Ramsay, always a good sport, arrived at the restaurant and was welcomed by Peter's entourage, including his two friends, Jerry and Jerry, who legit looked like they were cast members from a mob movie. Gordon wasn't exactly impressed by the scene, but he was curious about the food. Enter server Angelo, who recommended the crab cake and lobster ravioli, poor guy. When the crab cake arrived, it was paired with a salad that had rotten bits. Rotten. Bits. Like rotten? Huh? How old is that salad? Take it back before something jumps out of there. I'll just taste the crab cake. Okay. And... It didn't get any better from there. The crab cake was cold. And the lobster ravioli? Yeah, Chef Ramsay said it was basically baby food smothered in parsley. Just hearing that made Angelo frustrated as he brought the plate back to the kitchen. Things escalated when Peter got involved, and before you knew it, the kitchen was popping off. There ain't your problem. Yeah, but I don't need to hear criticism, which I already know then the dish has too much. John did it. Go yell it in. Chef Ramsay had to intervene, so he sat the family down for a serious talk. But let's be real, this wasn't a calm family chat. Everyone was talking over each other, yelling, pointing fingers, and Peter? He was emotional AF. Yeah. The next day, Chef Ramsay did his kitchen inspection, and what he found was a horror show. We're talking moldy food, a walk-in fridge that was leaking and at the wrong temperature, and a broken freezer. It was like a scene from Stranger Things, but with food. Yeah, they look like fucking camel's turd. It looks like something out of a fucking sci-fi movie. Chef Ramsay straight up told them that they were on the verge of poisoning someone. Peter, of course, rolled in late and tried to pass the buck to the kitchen staff. But Chef wasn't having it. Then, the pièce de résistance. Chef Ramsay asked the family to smell a tub of old ravioli. It was a no thanks from the Pellegrinos, but Chef Ramsay wasn't playing games. Just, just smell that for me. No, no, just, just smell it. I just got it Yeah, okay. Just, just smell it though, Tina. They needed a serious deep clean. Dinner service was a whole new kind of chaotic. Peter was handing out comped food and drinks like he was Oprah. You get a free meal, and you get a free meal. It was like he thought he was running a charity instead of a restaurant. Chef Ramsay was shook when Peter revealed he wasn't charging his doctor, who, get this, always got free food. Do you take care of it personally, or do you put it on the business? Goes off the top. It's an expense. Chef Ramsay was fuming, especially since this guy was loaded and could clearly afford to pay his bill. As if things couldn't get worse, a bill collector waltzed into the kitchen mid-service, and Peter just snapped. A full-blown brawl broke out outside the restaurant, with punches flying, and their poor father got caught in the crossfire. Uh -huh. But other than that, I'm having a breakdown. Tell me your biggest frustration. What's the one big issue that you have? Peter, emotionally unstable as always, was left shouting and screaming. Chef Ramsay had to step in, telling him to chill out. Later, Chef Ramsay sat down with Tina, who admitted that Peter had been stealing from the till hundreds of dollars. She was on the verge of losing everything. The restaurant, her house, her sanity. It's like, I didn't even fucking break even for the day and he took money. It was heartbreaking. Peter, meanwhile, was off worrying about what designer suit he'd wear next. The next day, Chef Ramsay had Peter and his father run the kitchen to give them a taste of how hard it was. Spoiler, it was a total disaster. Peter had no idea what he was doing, demanding espressos and orange juice like he was at a cafe instead of, you know, working. Someone get me Tina, please. I need orange juice. You want Tina to stop now? After an hour, no food had left the kitchen, and Peter couldn't figure out where anything was, even though it was all right in front of him. Chef Ramsay finally lost it and kicked Peter out of the kitchen. 
he was done with the drama. Would you do me a favor? Uh, yeah. We go out. Go and get some fresh air or yeah, I'll go get a proper manicure. Polish your wheels or do something. The following day, Chef Ramsay revealed a brand new kitchen, complete with functioning equipment, new plates, and a fresh refrigerator. He also introduced a new family-style menu that included lasagna, grilled flank steak, and a revamped lobster ravioli. When the relaunch happened, things started off pretty rocky. Peter was too busy sipping pineapple juice and cappuccinos to take his job seriously. Actually, you know what? Do you have pineapple juice? Yeah. Give me pineapple juice with a lot of ice and a splash of cranberry. Yeah. It's good for my sugar. But eventually, the food started going out, and surprise, surprise, the customers actually loved it. Despite all the hiccups, the relaunch was a hit. Chef Ramsay gave Peter a pep talk, telling him that the restaurant would honestly run better without him there. I think this place will run better without you. Peter seemed to take it to heart for like a day. The next morning, he was on the phone trying to fix the fridge. Things were looking up, kind of. We need our walk-in box fixed. It's leaking here. There's like, oh, she has rainwater. I want you to come here and uh, do whatever it needs to. In a turn that shocked no one, though, the restaurant didn't last long after Chef Ramsay left. And Peter's Italian restaurant closed its doors for good in December 2008. Next up, we got this family-owned Giuseppe's Pizza restaurant, which became a battleground between the father and son owners, Joe and Sam. A son who is unable to step up. So why can't you show me the same fire I had and just go up there and try it? Chef Ramsay pulled up to Giuseppe's Trattoria, and right from the jump, things are hella outdated. The decor looks like it got stuck in a time warp from the 70s, even though the restaurant's only two years old. But we're not here for design critiques, we're here for the drama, and it kicks off quick. As soon as Chef Ramsay steps into the kitchen to try out the food, the whole place starts to fall apart. The first red flag? Sam and Joe, the father-son duo, arguing loudly while Chef Ramsay's tasting some questionable dishes. And when the chef takes a bite of the octopus salad, it's game over. The octopus is straight up rubber. Chef spits it out, no hesitation. The octopus is like rubber. Excuse me. The potato skins? A total mess with cheese so nasty it could haunt your dreams. And the eggplant rollatini? Microwaved rubber. Chef Ramsay is not impressed. But here's where things heat up. Chef walks into the kitchen to discuss the disaster, and Joe instantly gets defensive. He tries to shut Chef down by saying they've got 3,000 positive responses from customer questionnaires. Chef, we got probably 3,000 responses that we did this questionnaire, and we didn't get one negative thing about the food. Like, bro, do you even realize you're on Kitchen Nightmares? Chef Ramsay snaps back with the cold, hard truth. Those questionnaires mean nothing when people don't even come back. The next day's dinner service takes the chaos to another level. Joe's back in the kitchen, totally hovering over Sam, refusing to let him take control. It's like watching a parent micromanage every little thing. Sam can't catch a break. Dad, I put it on a flat top, I put the Cajun seasoning on, I put it on there, and I put both sides medium wear black, and is that what black in this? And of course, it leads to one of the wildest freakouts. Joe straight up kicks Sam out of the kitchen in front of everyone. Yeah, you heard that right. He literally boots his own son out of the kitchen, leaving Sam standing there like a kid who just got grounded. Sam, get your ass out of there. Just try to make a man. Chef Ramsay's done with Joe's antics and confronts him, but Joe just keeps on being stubborn, like, dude, let your son cook. Chef Ramsay asks the family to write letters to each other, basically forcing them to address their issues. Sam writes about how Joe never notices or appreciates him, and man, you can feel the tension rise. My father doesn't really talk to me that much, and, you know, I feel that sometimes you hate. Joe tries to defend himself, calling Sam lazy for not putting in enough hours, but Sam's like, he doesn't even talk to him. It gets super intense as they argue, with Sam finally telling Joe he's never complimented him or acknowledged his efforts. I've been wanting you to fucking notice me for how I don't know. How many times you looked at me and said, hey. Then Chef Ramsay brings the kitchen back to life with a father-son cooking competition. Joe and Sam face off in a blind taste test. Joe's pork dish beats Sam's salmon, and you can feel the awkward vibes, but at least Chef Ramsay decides both dishes are solid. They're both good enough to go on this menu tonight, yes? That's what's gonna happen. The next big freakout happens during the relaunch. Joe's supposed to be expediting, but guess what? He can't stay away from the line. He's back at the stove, micromanaging Sam again. Are you expediting? No, not really. I can't read without my glasses. Your glasses around your neck. Things hit the fan when dishes start getting sent back because they're raw. Customers are not having it, and Chef Ramsay finally steps in and gets Joe out of the kitchen. Sam, yeah, kick him off there. 
With Joe stepping away from the line, Sam and Brian managed to take control of the kitchen and get things back on track. And even though it wasn't perfect, the staff pushed through and made it work. Though the evening specials were successful, Chef Ramsay reminded the team that they still had a long way to go before the restaurant would be ready for a full relaunch. The efforts weren't quite good enough. If they wanted to achieve lasting success, there was more work to be done. The team was left with a challenge for the next day. To aim higher, perform better, and prepare for the big relaunch that could make or break their future. The makeover at Giuseppe's was nothing short of dramatic. Overnight, the place was transformed into a sleek, contemporary Italian joint, complete with family photos for that extra heartwarming touch. When the family walked in the next day, they were hyped, buzzing with excitement about the new look. Look at this! To drum up some local love, they hosted Giuseppe's first ever bowlathon with the American Diabetes Association, and let me tell you, it was a hit. Giuseppe's bowlathon. We were greeted by a warm crowd cheering for us like we were some celebrities. But the real challenge was relaunch night. Chef Ramsay handed over a streamlined menu, and Sam was put in charge of the line while Joe was supposed to expedite. But of course, Joe couldn't resist sticking his nose in. I got three Marcellas coming on a fly. I need them, Sammy. Dan, get off the line. Go! Dishes started going out raw, and customers were sending plates back left and right. What's wrong? It's raw. Oh, fuck it. Oh, Sam! Yes! Not now, buddy. I've got pink chicken. Okay. Brian? Oh, he completely lost it. Ranting, blaming Chef Ramsay, and storming out like it was someone else's fault. You just said you blamed me. Did you? On the shit I ate when I first arrived. Let's go. With him gone, Joe and Sam finally teamed up, and the kitchen ran smooth again, earning major props from the diners. I like that laugh. Yeah, you did an excellent job today, Sam. The night ends with Chef Ramsay making them read out the letters they wrote. And yeah, it turns into a full-on tear fest. Love, Ma. Thank you. For the first time, Joe, Kathy, and Sam are actually talking to each other instead of screaming. Giuseppe's relaunch was a hit, but sadly, the restaurant didn't last. It closed down in July 2009, and Joe and Kathy blamed the economy and their lack of a liquor license. But at least Sam went on to become executive chef at Verona in the Cambria Hotel, proving he wasn't just living in his dad's shadow. And that's how the crazy saga of Giuseppe's Trattoria ended. Now that was intense. But hold on to your seats because we got another episode featuring the mixing bowl where things got seriously wild. Why do you keep saying that? I'm pissed off! The manager is desperate. I've tried everything. The owner has lost his passion. You look like a man that's dying to be put out of his misery. Located in Belmore, New York, this spot had been around for 10 years but was on the brink of closure. Owned by Billy Galletti and his wife Lisa, the restaurant faced heavy competition from newer places popping up in the area. And if you thought the struggling business was the only problem, well, buckle up. Behind the scenes, the drama was next level crazy. As soon as Chef Ramsay rolled up to the mixing bowl, he could tell something was off. The place was dead. No customers, no bookings, it was like a ghost town. Immediately, Mike, the manager, swooped in, ready to impress. Except the only thing Mike impressed Chef Ramsay with was his lack of knowledge. He claimed the mixing bowl served healthy food. But Chef Ramsay took one look at him and quipped that Mike clearly wasn't taking his own advice. I'm asking, awesome. when was the last time you went to the gym? Oh, uh, yeah, not for a long time. When was the last time we had a salad? After a quick look at the tired decor and rundown table settings, Chef Ramsay decided to dive into the menu. He asked for the restaurant's supposed award winning crab cakes, but Mike couldn't even name what award they'd won. Yikes. Not a great start. They are excellent. An award winning? What award did they win? You could ask Billy, he knows more about it. When the food finally arrived, it was a disaster. Chef Ramsay got served crab cakes and zucchini pancakes both at the same time. The pancakes were bland and thick, and the crab cakes weren't even fresh. To top it all off, the salmon was smothered in garlic, drowning out any real flavor. Bland. Look, pancakes were soggy and fish was dry. The salmon just, it just looked old-fashioned. And all the while, Mike hovered over him like a hawk, desperate for validation. It got so awkward that Chef Ramsay had to ask him to back off. Classic cringe moment. After that chaotic meal, Chef Ramsay hit the kitchen to give Billy the bad news. But when he told Billy that Mike was hovering too much and that the food was garbage, Billy and Lisa didn't seem to take the feedback well. They were totally convinced their food was great. That never happens. So either he's crazy or every customer that comes in here is lying to me. After dinner service, Chef Ramsay didn't hold back. He told Billy and Lisa they had to rein in Mike and ditch the pointless promotions. The real kicker came when Chef Ramsay offered them the choice. 
shut the restaurant down that night or give it one last shot. Lisa was ready to call it quits, but Billy, ever the optimist, wanted to give it one more try. Let me turn this around. <sighs> Seriously? Yeah. The next day, Chef Ramsay had enough of Mike's antics. To make sure there was no turning back, he grabbed all those useless signs and ran them through a wood chipper. It was savage and satisfying all at once. To Valentine's Day. Mike and his signs out of the way, Chef Ramsay gathered the staff and showed them a map of the area, pointing out that the number of restaurants had exploded from 4 to 41 in the past decade. They all realized that the restaurant needed a brand new identity, and they decided to lean into their healthy angle, making the mixing bowl the go-to health spot in town. To put Billy's skills to the test, Chef Ramsay set up a cook-off, challenging him to create a new dish using 10 fresh ingredients. Billy stepped up and created a killer salmon dish that Chef Ramsay loved, giving it a spot on the new menu that the mixing bowl should be serving. I like that. Both dishes are good enough to go on the menu tonight. The real test came with the relaunch dinner service. The place was packed, and it was time to see if the mixing bowl could handle the pressure. But of course, Mike was up to his old tricks, schmoozing with his buddies and ignoring the actual customers. He even managed to overbook the night, causing chaos right from the start. As soon as those doors opened and the floodgates opened up and everyone kind of came at once, it was a little bit stressful. Things got even worse when a group of local football players arrived and, surprise, surprise, Mike had forgotten to reserve them a table. Instead of owning up to his mistake, he flipped out and screamed at Lisa in front of all the customers, creating an insanely tense moment. It was so bad that Chef Ramsay had to send Mike outside to cool off. In the aftermath, Chef Ramsay had a tough talk with Billy and Lisa, suggesting they seriously reconsider keeping Mike around. Lisa wanted him gone, but Billy, ever the softy, gave him another chance. Mike returned to the restaurant, tail between his legs, and promised to step up his game. So everybody else in the place to give you a second chance. So Mike should give you a second chance, and we're gonna move forward together. Despite the chaos, the night turned into a success. Customers loved the new dishes, and for once, the restaurant was packed. Man, it seemed like the mixing bowl was finally on the up and up. So what happened next? Well, for a while, things looked promising. The restaurant even hosted a fun run called the First Annual Mixing Bowl Mile, and Billy was out of the kitchen, mingling with customers. Chef Ramsay paid a visit and was impressed to see that profits were up, and even Mike had become a better manager. Billy and Lisa's marriage had improved now that the restaurant wasn't such a burden. But by January 2009, the Mixing Bowl was closed for good. Turns out, the restaurant had shut down right before filming and reopened just for the show. After the cameras left, the restaurant didn't last long. Today, a Greek restaurant called Greek Delight stands where the Mixing Bowl once was. The Mixing Bowl might be gone, but the drama lives on forever. Craziest freakouts indeed. Now, we got another episode that tops the list for the craziest freakouts. He's doing a natural for 40. Yes, he is doing a natural for 40. And finds a family at war. The Kitchen Nightmares episode where Chef Ramsay pulled up to Burger Kitchen in LA, a family run restaurant that's barely surviving. Imagine being 16 months into a new business and already on the verge of collapse. Alan Saffron, the owner, used $250,000 of his son Daniel's inheritance money to kickstart this dream, and the result? A literal nightmare. Daniel didn't even have a say in it, and yet, the family was now bleeding $6,000 a month. From the get-go, the tension between Alan and Daniel was thick. Alan made all the important decisions, and Daniel was pretty much left in the dark about the business side of things. No wonder the place was a mess. Chef Ramsay arrived at this trendy 3rd Street location, impressed by the exterior. But that was about as good as it got. The minute he sat down, it was clear something was off. Alan and his wife Jen laid the blame on constantly changing chefs and staff, having gone through 20 service staff and 20 chefs in just over a year. If that wasn't enough, Alan was convinced Yelp was sabotaging his restaurant. He was dead serious, claiming the site deleted his 5-star reviews and only left the bad ones. Yelp has killed us. Yelp has crashed us terribly. They're also deleting 5-star reviews. Right off the bat, you knew Chef Ramsay had his work cut out for him. As he sat down to order, the waitress Marilyn spilled the tea about the restaurant's dysfunction. Inconsistent burgers, staff infighting, and no real management. It was a disaster. There's lack of management nice. and burgers. They're never cooked right. They're always sent back. Chef Ramsay ordered the California and Cowboy burgers, both medium rare, along with an Australian meat pie. The results? Absolute trash. The burgers were raw, flavorless, and the buns were sad doughy, tasteless, and just… wrong. The meat pie? Chef Ramsay said it tasted like cat food. Soggy, gooey stuff on the bottom. One word for this. Meow. Cat food. 
filthy, disgusting. Then came David Blaine, the so-called executive chef. He'd been a pastry chef, but somehow found himself at the helm of the kitchen. David confessed he couldn't change a single thing on the menu and hadn't even been paid his full wages. The guy was stuck, following terrible recipes and fighting with Jen, who kept interfering in the kitchen. The two had zero respect for each other, but the drama wasn't over. During the dinner service, everything went downhill. Orders were messed up, burgers were undercooked, and the kitchen was in chaos. David, who couldn't keep up with the tickets, exploded at Daniel and got fired on the spot. Absolute mayhem. Hey, hold on, hold on. No, 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 I don't need you second guessing me, I'll just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to. The situation got worse when David returned not to finish his shift, but to demand the $1,000 he was owed. Alan and Jen didn't even have the cash to pay him, and David wasn't buying their promises to sort it out. Hey Jen, you fired me on a thousand dollar paycheck right now. California law states that you pay me before you fire me. Let's write my check. Chef Ramsey had seen enough. He took Daniel aside, trying to calm him down, reminding him that he was doing all of this to help his family. Daniel broke down, finally admitting how messed up everything was with the money and the lack of respect from his father. I mean, you're 29 years of age, you've got the world on your shoulders, for God's sake. This is crazy. What are you doing, you know? <laughs> Chef Ramsay was determined to resolve the family issues. He dragged the entire crew to a theater where he confronted Alan's conspiracy theories head on. Yelp reviewers and a community manager showed up to shut down Alan's wild accusations. But even after hearing it straight from the source, Alan refused to believe that the reviews were legit. It was like talking to a brick wall. Every Yelper lies. They hurt and damage restaurants by doing this. The family issues were next. Daniel revealed that the real root of the mistrust was his father taking his inheritance without permission. Alan tried to justify it, claiming he'd put in just as much money. But Daniel was adamant. He had no say, and now he wanted transparency. He wanted proof of ownership and access to the restaurant's finances. Dad, I never put 250000 into this. The next step, fix the food. Chef Ramsay introduced a new burger recipe using fresh ground beef. It was a total game changer. By the end of the relaunch, things were looking up. The new burger was a hit with customers, and Daniel proved he had what it took to run the place. Chef Ramsay's final surprise was a fully revamped restaurant, new murals, pop art, and a chalkboard wall for customers to leave messages. The ugly green color was gone, replaced by something far more inviting. Even the POS system was swapped for a handheld one, streamlining orders. With? Your wireless touch screen oh, device. Oh my god. Wow. Oh, that's how you place the order. Despite all the changes, though, Burger Kitchen eventually closed. The constant changes in staff and menu, coupled with the family drama, were too much to overcome. By February 2012, the doors were shut for good, leaving only memories of one of the craziest family meltdowns on Kitchen Nightmares. This episode? Easily one of the wildest freakouts in the show's history. And Chef Ramsay had his hands full trying to not only save a restaurant, but also mend a broken family. And finally, for the showdown, buckle up, because this is one of the wildest rides in Kitchen Nightmares history. The episode opening with Chef Ramsay walking into Dylan's, a New York City restaurant that's just confused. It can't decide if it's Indian, American, or Irish. It's like a restaurant with a serious identity crisis. What the fuck is that sign there? It's like a scoreboard. Owner Mohammed opened this place with good intentions, trying to make a better life for his family. But the restaurant's been bleeding money, $20,000 a month to be exact. Ouch. He's got three managers on payroll, Martin, the general manager, Andrew, the operations manager, and Khan, the floor manager. With this many managers, you'd think they'd have their act together, but nope, chaos is about to go down. Chef Ramsay sits down to try the food, and the nightmare starts almost immediately. The menu is massive, like, way too big. And while he's being served by Jenna, flies are buzzing around like it's their own personal buffet. Jenna admits to Chef Ramsay that the restaurant is dead most nights, sometimes with no customers at all. Do you normally this busy for lunch? Oh, actually, it's a little busy today. <laughs> the food arrives, and it's a disaster from the jump. The vegetarian appetizer has meat in it. Yep, you heard that right. Meat. In a veggie dish. That's lawsuit level bad. Then there's the beef buna, except it isn't beef, it's lamb. And to top it off, Andrew, who isn't even a chef, cooked an overdone salmon dish using frozen fish because they ran out of fresh. Talk about amateur hour. There's meat in there. Um, that one's got meat in there. Chef Ramsay is straight up disgusted and storms into the kitchen to give them a piece of his mind, while things in the kitchen weren't any better. At one point, a chef literally put a giant tub of raw chicken on the floor. On the floor! 
Like, did they miss day one of food safety? Floor. Hygiene, anyone? Chef Ramsay had to step in and remind them that it was super unsanitary and dangerous. Lift it off the floor. Fast forward nearly an hour and still no food had left the kitchen. Absolute chaos. And then Andrew was supposed to be leading the kitchen, but Khan was just chilling, not saying a word. This is Dylan's. Dylan's Indian restaurant. Indian restaurant, yes. Doesn't sound like an Indian, does it? Dylan's. No. No. Dylan's, no. Then, to make it worse, they ran out of salmon, Martin is off somewhere on his phone like he's got no care in the world. Eventually, Chef Ramsay loses it and calls Martin a fake. He accuses him of taking advantage of Muhammad by doing absolutely nothing and still collecting a paycheck. Not with customers, but with his phone. Chef Ramsay completely lost it. He called Martin out, straight up accusing him of being a fake and taking advantage of Muhammad. Ramsay wasn't wrong. Martin had no idea how to manage a kitchen, let alone a restaurant. You're such a fake. I'm not fake, I'm just... Why, why are you saying I'm a fake? As if the night couldn't get worse. The service is a complete disaster. Customers started walking out because they were either grossed out by the flies or because they hadn't even been served food yet. But the worst is yet to come. Chef Ramsay returns the next day for a full kitchen inspection and what he finds is straight up horror movie material. We're talking dead flies stuck to flypaper, green chicken, rotting vegetables, piles of rat droppings, and cockroaches everywhere. This place is a health hazard. Uh, that one is... Well, at least the flies look fresh. Oh my god. What's that smell? For this God's sake! Look at that! Look! At this point, Chef Ramsay's seen enough. He orders the kitchen shut down immediately and asks all the customers to leave. But Chef Ramsay doesn't just walk away from disasters, he suits up in a full exterminator outfit, brings in an army of professional cleaners, and does a full deep clean of the restaurant. That the kitchen is closed, right now. Out there and tell them the truth. I mean clean, yeah? Guys, let's go. These guys are professional steam cleaners. Once the place is spotless, Chef Ramsay gets down to business. First, he takes Mohammed and the managers to his own restaurant to show them what cleanliness and organization look like. Then, it's time for a total menu overhaul. Dylan's is no longer serving a ridiculous mashup of cuisines. Nope, it's going to be an Indian restaurant, plain and simple. Chef Vikas Khanna, one of New York's top Indian chefs, steps in to help train the staff and run the kitchen. Vikas Khanna. Good to see you, buddy. Are you well? I need you here to work with a team of chefs. The next day, the restaurant gets a complete makeover inside and out. The tacky, flashing sign is gone, replaced with a sleek new one. The name. Purnima, meaning full moon in Sanskrit, which fits the new authentic Indian vibe. The staff's thrilled, and the food? Absolutely fire. Everything's looking up, but Chef Ramsay still isn't convinced Martin can handle his role. So he turns to Khan, encouraging him to step up and take control. Martin is not qualified for a GM. I don't see the confidence that he need that I can run this restaurant. Ready, guys? Ready, everything is ready, but I've got none. As the night goes on, things start to unravel again, with Martin doing his usual disappearing act. But Khan steps up big time and saves the day, running the restaurant smoothly. Thanks to him and Vikas, the relaunch is a success. Customers are happy, the food is amazing, and the restaurant is finally running like a proper establishment. So they want the lamb, uh, the ladies, the, yeah. The next day, Chef Ramsay advises Mohammed to fire one of the managers to cut costs and suggests keeping Vikas on as a consultant. Martin overhears this and, feeling guilty, or maybe just defeated, quits on the spot. It's a huge relief for everyone involved, especially Mohammed, who can finally move forward with a strong, reliable team. What about you? What about, what about you? I have nothing to be guilty of. You want? Nothing. In the end, Chef Ramsay gave Dylan's, now Purnima, a fighting chance. But even with the makeover, it didn't last long. Purnima closed its doors in 2009. The restaurant's gone, but the episode? Iconic. And Martin? Well, he tried suing Chef Ramsay for $3 million, claiming the show ruined his career, but the case was thrown out. Guess some people just can't handle the truth. And that's the story of one of the most chaotic, disgusting, and honestly ridiculous episodes of Kitchen Nightmares ever. Total freakout after freakout, and a masterclass in how not to run a restaurant. So that's a wrap on today's list of craziest freakouts on Kitchen Nightmares. Can you think of more times when things blew out of control on the show? Make sure to let me know in the comments below, and, and if you like this video, don't forget to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications.